So now it is my pleasure to introduce our next guest speaker, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Dr. Gottlieb serves as the 23rd Commissioner of the United States Food and Drug Administration, a position he was appointed to in May of 2017. Dr. Gottlieb is a physician, a medical policy expert, a public health advocate. He has worked in multiple roles for the United States federal government, including as the FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Medical and Scientific Affairs, and before that, as a senior advisor to the FDA Commissioner and as the FDA's Director of Medical Policy Development. Dr. Gottlieb was previously a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a clinical assistant professor at the New York University School of Medicine in Manhattan, where he also practiced medicine as a hospitalist. As the FDA Commissioner, Dr. Gottlieb has advanced a host of initiatives and policy plans that has been unprecedented for that agency. Under his leadership, the FDA has taken steps that would enable it to fight high drug prices and to increase competition in the generics market, like listing branded drugs that lost patent exclusivity and undertaking expedited reviews of generic versions. But even more so, the FDA has undertaken what may be one of the most important public health initiatives of this century, an ambitious long-term strategy to finally end tobacco's cycle of addiction and death. Here to talk more about these initiatives is the U.S. FDA Commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, Cliff, for that uh, introduction. Before I get started, I just have to give some boilerplate that I have no relationships to disclose other than what's in my uh, ethics agreements, my ethics disclosures, which you can find by going to the New York Times website and Googling Scott Gottlieb and conflicts. I'm sure it's, uh, I'm sure it's there. It's a little joke, sorry. Uh, good morning. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here with you, uh, to share with you some of what we're doing at FDA, some of the work we're doing. It's a particular pleasure to be here at ASCO and be with ASCO. This has been a very important collaboration for the whole agency, not just our oncology division, but the agency as a whole. I want to highlight some of the new efforts we're pursuing across our entire drug development process. I'll just say at the outset, the scientific opportunities that we're seeing demand that we make sure our policies are as sophisticated as the treatments that are being developed. This science is bringing forward at a faster pace more novel opportunities to more meaningfully address human disease. And it's clear that humankind is still very much closer to the beginning than to the end of these endeavors. People try to paint any change we make in our regulatory policy or to the policy requirements we impose as a binary choice between speed and safety. I think that's a false dichotomy. If we're adopting the right policies, if we're focused on incorporating the best science and making our own process more efficient, we can achieve greater certainty around the parameters that matter most to patients and providers. And yes, we can also make the overall development process itself less costly, less risky, and less time consuming. In this way, we can lower the barriers to bringing new science forward with the ultimate goal being to make sure more patients get benefit sooner from new advances. I want to focus my remarks today on these efforts and announce some of the new steps that we're going to be taking. But I want to begin with the basics when it comes to reducing the suffering and death from cancer. And that starts with reducing smoking rates. The bottom line is this. There's perhaps no single intervention or advance I can achieve on my watch at FDA that will have more impact on reducing the death and suffering from cancer than if we can sharply reduce people's use of combustible cigarettes. As part of the comprehensive plan we announced last year, we're advancing a process to regulate the nicotine levels in cigarettes to render them minimally, minimally or non-addictive. If cigarettes can no longer induce and sustain addiction, then our analysis shows that the overall smoking rates in this nation will sharply decline, and as a consequence, the generational impact in terms of life years gained is, quite frankly, enormous. At the same time, we're taking steps to help foster new technology that may offer adult smokers access to satisfying levels of nicotine, but without all of the harmful effects of combustion. 
These products must be put through an appropriate series of regulatory gates, and this includes e-cigarettes. We know that a lot of kids are using e-cigs, and we're deeply troubled by these trends. If by opening a path for e-cigs to be an alternative for adult smokers, all we end up doing is hooking a new generation of kids on nicotine, we'll have failed in our purpose. We'll have swapped one public health tragedy for a new one, and I don't intend to let that happen. So we're taking aggressive steps to bring enforcement actions against those who sell e-cigs to kids, and we're focusing on companies that market these products in ways that are meant to appeal to teenagers. And I've been clear to the e-cig industry that we're going to hold them accountable at every turn. The companies that market these products can't expect to build a business model that lets large numbers of kids get hooked on their products. These e-cig companies have a chance to do something about it. The window is open to them. But it won't be open for very long. They better step up, and they better step up soon to address these trends along with us. And so far, I must say I've mostly been disappointed by the tepid response from companies that know that a meaningful portion of their sales are being derived from kids. They need to see this as an urgent public health issue, not just a PR challenge for them. And it's more than their business model that's on the line. It's the lives of kids, and time is running out for these e-cig firms. But even if we're successful at making more progress against the public health basics, and dramatically lowering smoking rates and improving nutrition and increasing vaccination rates, People will still develop cancer, and people are still going to die from it. But there's more reason than ever for more cancer patients to expect to live longer lives and to even have a greater shot at a long-term remission or even a cure. But to harness these opportunities, we also need to make sure that our regulatory policies are as sophisticated as the drugs that we're being asked to evaluate. For the FDA, that means building a dynamic regulatory environment across the entire life cycle of product development. A little over a year ago, the FDA established the Oncology Center for Excellence to bring a disease-focused approach to oncology work. This new alignment gives us a broader platform to advance the science related to how new drugs are developed. In 2017, the FDA approved 16 new oncology drugs and biologics, including the first two cell-based CAR-T cell therapies. We also recently approved the first tissue agnostic cancer treatment. It was based on a biomarker that's associated with a specific DNA repair pathway that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Rather than requiring a separate development program for each disease site, which may have taken many years and may never have happened at all for some rare tumors, instead we created a single therapeutic approach based on a solid understanding of the underlying biology of microsatellite instability. There are critics who say we should hold drugs back from the market and demand more pre-market studies proving overall survival endpoints before we consider approving a new drug. I disagree. And I suspect some of the patients who face long odds for whom available therapy gives them just a slim chance of a long-term survival might also disagree. I had Hodgkin's lymphoma. I had a very curable form of it, a very curable tumor. At the time that I was diagnosed, I was told my odds of a cure were 90% or better. This was when I last worked at FDA. And for me, the available therapy was very promising. It's true that what I was searching for was pristine studies that could help me make a better decision on how to use that available therapy, those available drugs, to get that 90% up a few more percentage points. So I understand why demanding large, pristine studies ultimately serves the interests of patients like me. But my situation was very different than being diagnosed with a cancer and being told your chance of surviving five years is 50% or just 10%. Available therapy isn't very promising if that's your circumstance, and the ability to access novel treatments becomes more urgent in these circumstances. Waiting three more years for another large, prospective, randomized trial to be completed to confirm a highly promising result already ob observed in an earlier clinical trial may be unacceptable to the patient who faces these long odds. And so we need a regulatory system that serves both of these patients equally well, and that's the type of system that we're striving for. That's the sort of system that we're committed to having. It means establishing a framework that breaks down artificial silos between clinical research and clinical practice. It means harnessing real-world data at the point of care to help every patient access the best care available. 
It means enabling better access to experimental therapies being tested in clinical trials by modernizing eligibility criteria and conducting clinical trials in communities where patients live. In my opinion, this transformation isn't optional. The dysfunction of the current drug pricing models is driven by an outdated construct for clinical trials, at least in part, where failure is typically expensive and routine, and success is the exception. Without significant gains in productivity, the status quo is on a path to financial and scientific and clinical unsustainability. And so we need to make the entire process more efficient without sacrificing one bit of the scientific rigor. And that's where I'd like to spend the rest of my time here today. I want to announce a few new steps that we're taking at each stage of the drug development review process, from clinical trial recruitment to application submission and evaluation, and to modernizing our approach to post-market manufacturing. First on recruitment and clinical trial design. We know that traditional eligibility criteria often exclude the very patients most likely to be treated once the drug is on the market, the elderly, patients with poor performance status or organ dysfunction or other comorbidities. And even when patients are eligible, there may be geographic or financial barriers that prevent their participation, or patients may be understandably reluctant to break the therapeutic bond with their treating oncologist. All of these things limit patients' access to investigational agents and negatively impact the accrual to oncology clinical trials. Yet we also know that patients' race and ethnicity and geography all have been found to correlate with patient outcomes. In 2018, a cancer patient's hope for recovery shouldn't hinge on their socioeconomic status or their zip code. The irony is that even with broad exclusion criteria, oncology trials still have a staggering failure rate. One recent study by researchers at MIT found that in 2015, the overall success in cancer trials was only 8.3%, up from just 3.4% in 2005. High failure rates contribute to the industry's high cost of drug development, putting upward pressure on drug prices. And it also reduces the amount of competition that new drugs face when they enter the market. One way to cut this Gordian knot is to harness the vast amount of data generated by routine patient interactions through pragmatic clinical trials at the point of care. I know that one criticism of this strategy is that it appears to rationalize the untutored patient experimentation. But the reality is that extrapolating from median treatment effects and hazard ratios in highly selected patient groups may mean very little to a doctor trying to decide on the right course for a 56-year-old diabetic with a history of lymphoma or mean very low to a patient with metastatic melanoma and a history of autoimmune disease who needs a checkpoint inhibitor. What specific guidance can we offer these patients? We can't just tell them to wait. At the FDA, we're taking steps to advance our policies to embrace these opportunities. One step we're taking is providing more guidance to sponsors about how to include more underrepresented patients in clinical trials. Yesterday, we released one of those guidance documents focused on considerations for the inclusion of adolescent patients in adult oncology trials. If there's no evidence that an investigational drug might have an exaggerated toxicity in younger patients, then we're encouraging sponsors to enroll adolescents into disease-appropriate trials. We're also advancing new efforts to improve how we evaluate new applications as part of the clinical review process. In these ways, we believe we can make both the development process and the reviewer process, review process more efficient and more squarely focused on the most important scientific information. I'd like to announce in particular two pilots that we're currently undertaking. One is aimed at trying to focus submissions more squarely on data that's most relevant to assessing safety and effectiveness. The goal here is to improve the overall quality of applications and make sure that resources and review times are being focused on evaluating data that's most meaningful to clinicians and patients. This means making sure that what gets included in an application counts and what counts most isn't missing from these submissions. The worst possible time to discover this is after an application has been filed with the FDA. It delays the review and it adds to the time and cost of the process, including the staffing burdens on our agency. And so we're moving more of the review data up front, more of the review of the data up front earlier in the process before the applications even filed with the agency. The Oncology Center is addressing these goals by piloting what we're calling a real-time oncology review. Right now, this pilot's gonna be focused on new efficacy supplements 
for already approved cancer drugs. And if the pilot shows the efficiencies we expect, it could be expanded to drugs being considered for initial approval. Under the pilot, as soon as a sponsor locks their database and has decided they want to file for FDA approval, they'd start sharing the bottom line data with the agency. In effect, the agency will pre-review the data and assess it for adequacy and completeness. This informed pre-analysis gives reviewers and sponsors an early opportunity to address data quality issues. The FDA can provide early feedback on the most effective way to analyze data to properly address key regulatory questions. And by the time the sponsor files the application with the FDA, the agency's review team would already be very familiar with the data and the analysis. Review teams will be in a better position to conduct a more efficient, a timelier, and more thorough review. And sponsors will have benefited from feedback on how best to anal analyze data to effectively evaluate key regulatory questions. Based on our analysis, we believe that taking this approach can free up to 10 to 30 percent of the reviewer's time. This will leave more time for engagement with product developers and will lead to a more efficient review of drug applications. As we gain experience with this model, we believe that we can use this approach to create a dynamic data submission system that aligns the process around data quality based on early feedback and engagement with review teams. Issues of data quality and integrity can be addressed earlier in the process. This pilot is already underway, and a number of sponsors have already agreed to enter it. As part of this real-time review, we're also piloting a second new approach, a new assessment aid. This tool is a voluntary submission form that applicants can use to facilitate FDA's assessment of the drug application. Right now, we're using this assessment aid to also focus the review, on a review of supplemental applications. Under this templated approach to reviewing applications, we'll be using the sponsor's structured file, which follows a new template format that we're piloting as the basis for our review. And so instead of writing a separate analysis of the file, we'll use the sponsor's own submission and then layer in our review of that information. Under this approach, we'll annotate the sponsor's drug file with our assessment rather than creating a separate document that recapitulates many of the same data tables. In practice, the template is divided into two parts, the applicant's position and the FDA's assessment of that position. We'll make note right in the sponsor's file where we agree or disagree with the applicant and add any additional findings from our own analysis. Applicants fill in their positions and then send a document to FDA before or at the time of the submission, and the FDA review the team then adds the agency's assessment to that very same document. And this creates a more agile platform for reviewing data after the sponsor's database is locked. It permits us to focus on the key results and perform critical analyses that may have been omitted by the company. If a drug application makes it through the process, then the completed review using this assessment aid will be, be, be presented at the meeting of the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee. The annotated application will be presented as one single combined background document that contains both the applicant's opinion and the FDA's analysis of those positions. And under this pilot, the assessment aid is only being used again for supplemental applications, but if we're successful, we believe this approach could be expanded to original drug and biologic applications as well. And finally, we're also taking new steps after products are approved to make the manufacturing process more efficient. For some of the most promising new products, in particular cell-based medicines and gene therapies, the most complex issues can turn on product features related to their manufacturing. So we're taking some new steps to create more standardization across FDA's requirements for manufacturing. Different treatments could share a common platform for manufacturing and for delivering these therapies. And this, in turn, could reduce the amount of novelty as institutions take on the task of delivering many of these different cell and gene therapies. It could also make it cheaper and easier for one platform to be used to manufacture and deliver multiple different treatment types. These are just some of the steps we're taking at each stage of our development process. We're at a turning point right now in the history of cancer. And you all know that better than I do. A world has been created in many places, certainly not all, but in many places, where individual health and wellness is more clearly and more rapidly becoming a beneficiary of technological progress. We're challenging ourselves at the FDA to make sure that we have the best approach to bringing forward these opportunities. We look forward to working with you on these and many other efforts as we advance our shared goals to reduce 
the personal and societal burden of cancer and to bring more patients the hope for a cure. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here today.